One thing we want to think about now is the particular topic of conversion. But before I do that, I want to see who I'm speaking to these next couple of days. So I'm going to ask you to stand up a few times, all right? But you should feel free and look around to see who's here. So everybody, stand up. Now, uh, I, want, uh, I want your name. I'm serious. And your denomination, loudly. We're going to start right here. What kind of Baptist? Independent Baptist. All right, if you're independent Baptist, sit down at your own rate whenever you want to, but now. All right. Great. All right. Chris. Independent Reformed. Okay, whatever that means. If that's you, please be seated. Okay. All right. Matthew Freeman. Southern Baptist. If that's you, please be seated. Oh, that's the largest group so far. I'd say 10%, 20% maybe. R.C.? PCA, please be seated. All right, that's like another 20%. Yes, sir? Okay, PCA, please be seated. Great. Yes, sir? Non, and now how's that different than independent reformed? <laughs> okay. Non-dominational reform, please be seated. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Great. Evangelical church mm, in Africa. Please be seated. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yes, right here. Non-denominational, please be seated. Yet still some remain standing. Yes. PC USA, please be seated. All right. Whoa, and there we go. A good number. All righty. Yes. E free, please be seated. Oh, and some stood back up. That's a v- <laughs> that is such an interesting development. We'll, we'll come to you in a moment. Sister, how about over here? Say again. United Methodist, please be seated. All right, a few United Methodists scattered around. Yes, over here. American Baptist, please be seated. Okay, right there. Yes. United Reformed, URC. Brian Lee is the pastor, a fine man. It's a fine congregation. We, we do pray for them. So United Reformed, please be seated. Okay, a few of you. Yes. Now, have you all decided? Okay. Did, did you just switch during the? <laughs> okay, Presbyterian Church in Canada, or if you're in Bermuda, please be seated. Great, yes. North American Baptist. Now, is that like German, or is that landmarkists, or what is that? German, okay. North American Baptist, please be seated. Danke. All right, yes, and… Evangelical friends. Great. Please be seated. If you feel you should. Um, Yes. Reformed Baptist, please be seated. Really? Okay. Yes. Okay. None of the other independents, just independent. All right. All right. Really independent. Please be seated. Just be seated. Just… Deeply meant independent. Yes. What? Episcopalian, please be seated. Great. Yep. Okay. Independence, please be seated. All of you, just now, be seated if you're independent. If you're independent. All right. Yes. Reformed Church of New Zealand. All right, please be seated. Great. BGC, Baptist General Conference, the dear Swedes, please be seated. Yep, over here. OPC, please be seated. We should be running out of denominations sometime soon. Yes. 
Sovereign grace. You guys, of course, don't need to be seated, okay? <laughs> All right, yes. EPC. All right, EPC, please be seated. Great. ELCA. Great. Please be seated. A couple of ELCA. Yep. Say again. Grace Brethren. All right, please be seated. Okay. Free Methodist. That sounds wonderfully free. All right. Because when I hear Methodist, I think free already. And then when I hear free Methodist, wow. All right. Are you separating yourself from your brother over there? I mean, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. If it's, yes. CRC. All right. Please be seated. There go a couple. I think we're running out. Yep. RCA. All right. Great. I was just with some RCA brothers up in Chicago in May. Had, had a great time. Yep. Associate Reformed Presbyterian. Okay. Yep. Primitive Baptists. Now, may I ask you a question? Are you a pastor? Do primitive Baptist, this is a serious question, do primitive Baptist churches these days have paid pastors, or is that still not considered appropriate? Okay. Interesting. Okay, great. Thank you for being here. And is that everybody now? One more time. AME Methodist. Great. Good to have you. Well, that was interesting. Thank you for that. And what a mixed group. I mean, it's not the largest groups for Southern Baptist and PCA, and I'd say they're each like maybe 15% of the folks here. That's interesting. All right, stand up again. <laughs> this is so interesting. I'm now looking for your main role in your church, okay? So if you are not, and I, I don't have time to do all the different roles that there are, so I'm just going to do this real simply. If you are not an elder uh, in your church, please be seated. So, some people aren't sure. <laughs> that in and of itself is interesting. I, I, I see more sitting down as they think about it more. All right. If you are not a teaching elder, please be seated. Okay. If you are not the one who normally teaches on Sunday mornings in your congregation, please be seated. So the people remaining standing are the, the brothers who normally bring God's Word to their congregation on Sunday mornings. Okay, I want to do two things with you guys. First, uh, if you have been pastoring the congregation where you are now for more than five years, please be seated. For more than five years, please be seated. Uh, if you've been pastoring the congregation where you currently are for more than four years, please be seated. Three years, please be seated. Two years, please be seated. So the people who are standing, I understand, are senior pastors of their congregations for less than two years. Wonderful. For less than 18 months, please remain standing. Several of them took a while counting that one. <laughs> For less than one year, please remain standing. And I think we have a winner, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, uh, brother, what's your name? And Alan, where are you? Ashburn, Georgia. What church? First United Methodist. And how long have you been the minister there? Five months. Five months. Uh, Matthew Freeman is going to bring you a set of four books that we hope will be an encouragement to you, the Feshrift that Ligonier did sort of for John Calvin for the celebration of his uh, birthday recently, um, the uh, book by Ed Clowney on the church, which is superb, with some other good materials that we hope will be an encouragement to you. Now, if those senior ministers who are just standing, if you can all stand again, the senior ministers who are just standing, stand again, and I just want to work it the other direction now. We're thinking of how long you've been pastoring the congregation you're currently pastoring. So we'll begin with Alan sitting down because he is the, the, the junior among us at that. 
And now if you've been pastoring your congregation for less than five years, the congregation you're currently in, for less than five years, please be seated. Less than 10 years, please be seated. Less than 15 years, please be seated. Less than 20 years, please be seated. Less than 25 years, please be seated. Less than 30 years, please be seated. And again, I think we have one brother. Yes, can you give us your name and your church? Wow, in Anchorage. Wonderful, brother. Thank you for being with us. And Matthew is bringing another couple of books for you just to encourage you in the ministry there. Well, thank you for bearing with me in that. It's good to see who's here, good to get a sense of that. I want us to think about conversion, and let me just tell you why. Let me go on and and front load this. This is where I'm going with this. I think biblical faithfulness entails, and the words here are chosen carefully, apparent exclusivity in our churches. I think biblical faithfulness entails apparent exclusivity in our churches. I bring this up because I think that the common wisdom today among pastors is that that's not the case. What I want to do first is confirm that we're thinking the same biblical thoughts about conversion. And then, like in the last 10 minutes of what I want to say, I want to run this into a mindset that we're increasingly finding among evangelical pastors today and asking how these things that we believe the Bible teaches about conversion fit with what we're being told to do in our churches and think together about this as a meeting of pastors. Here's Langston Hughes, uh, the famous writer of the Harlem Renaissance, writing about his own upbringing in African-American churches in the early 20th century, quoting Hughes here. I was saved from sin when I was going on 13, but not really saved. It happened like this. There was a big revival at my Aunt Reed's church. Every night for weeks there had been much preaching, singing, praying, and shouting. Finally, all the young people had gone to the altar and were saved but one boy and me. He was named Wesley. Wesley and I were surrounded by sisters and deacons praying. It was very hot in the church and getting late now. Finally, Wesley said to me in a whisper, I'm tired of sitting here. Let's get up and be saved. So he got up and was saved. Then I was left all alone on the mourner's bench. My aunt came and knelt at my knees and cried while prayers and songs swirled all around me in the little church. The whole congregation prayed for me alone in a mighty wail of moans. God had not struck Wesley dead for taking his name in vain or for lying in the temple. So I decided that maybe to save further trouble, I'd better lie too and say that Jesus had come and get up and be saved. So I got up. Suddenly the whole room broke into a sea of shouting as they saw me rise. I couldn't bear to tell her that I had lied, that I had deceived everybody in the church, that I hadn't seen Jesus, and that now I didn't believe there was a Jesus anymore. Friends, you can go to bookstores and find lots of accounts of people growing up in Christian churches and being around a witness to the gospel who are not believers. And that's not just something in literature from 70 years ago. Gina Welch has a very popular book out earlier this year called In the Land of Believers. She lives on Capitol Hill. She came to see me not long after it came out, and she told me her story. What she did, she is from a a secular background uh, from Berkeley, California, uh, but she was concerned that our nation was too politically divided, so she wanted to see what this Christian conservative world was all about, so she moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, much to the horror of her family, and she joined Thomas Road Baptist Church. Uh, the Baptist Church made famous by the ministry of of Jerry Falwell some years ago. Uh, In in, uh, 2006, uh, she uh, joined the church, and when she was writing in her book about this experience of joining the church, she actually gave an expose of how even she, as an atheist, experienced what she called the sort of feeling X, this feeling of religious engagement and even ecstasy 
uh, as a complete atheist in the church. And she went ahead and joined the church uh, deceptively uh, in order to get inside it and to understand uh, other people. Honestly, for many people today, such hypocrisy, however, is, is, I think, less of a problem than the actual idea of conversion itself. Do you realize how offensive that idea is increasingly to people in the 21st century? It doesn't seem civil. In fact, to some people it seems rude to the point of intolerance. Uh, To others it seems even scary. What's going on? People today are skeptical, really, that anyone can change. Politicians, lawyers, preachers, professors, reporters, lobbyists. I mean, everybody has their predetermined vices, don't they? Wisdom today is thought to be in learning to accept your internal circumstances, to adjust to them, to adapt to them, not to try to fundamentally change them. What is it Freud wrote? It is through love and work that we exchange crippling emotional conflict for ordinary unhappiness. The die is cast, the lot is fixed, our personality is assigned. And except for some terrible trauma, the assumption today is that the leper does not change his spots, the anxious person his personality, the insecure person their psyche, and that's the way it is. And maturity comes with us facing up to that truth and resigning ourselves to it. That's what our world around us says and believes. And a suggestion that you can change deeply is regarded with serious suspicion. Any such suggestion is taken to be a potentially sinister tool of manipulation in the hands of the person who would coerce you into conformity to their standards by cultivating in you a kind of self-hatred, a loathing of some characteristic of yourself in your own person, whether that would be your sexual desires or your vocational ambitions or your ethical standards or your religious beliefs. What we're taught today is we are who we are. And we are taught to be proud of it. But for all of this uncertainty and suspicion, even about the possibility of change, there is no denying that people do have a deep longing for change. There's no doubt. There's a restlessness about the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And if the truth were known, a dissatisfaction with ourselves that is as widespread as it is deep-seated. We are not content, and so we rearrange the furniture, we paint the hallway, we buy some new clothes. If it gets worse, we wonder if changing where we live wouldn't be helpful. We, we work to have flexible hours at our job. If we think it's possible, we might even work to change our job. Sometimes we may even long for changing our spouse. And today, the more traditionally fixed boundaries of sexuality and of life itself are transgressed in vain attempts to find satisfaction, to meet the deep lack of satisfaction that we find in our own selves and situations. And yet, as at work and at jobs, marriages, families, even gender and death, as they all become subject to our own choices, we seem to find ourselves defeated and trapped and hopeless. Again and again, Christians do hold out hope of a different, a better, a more humane life to non-Christians around them. There does seem to be something, even to non-Christians, that's going on with Christians. And they're curious when they find real Christians. In one of Paul's earliest letters in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul refers to the conversion of the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, after Paul left Thessalonica, the conversions there had produced such obvious changes that they had caused such a stir that Paul himself, far away, continued to hear about them wherever he went. Conversions had happened, change had happened, and it made a difference. 
The news traveled faster than Paul did. The reception that the Thessalonians gave Paul and his gospel is spelled out in those verses in verses 9 and 10. They turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. Fine epitome of saving faith. Turning to God from idols to serve the living and true God to wait for His Son from heaven. True conversion will always involve turning in faith to the true God from the false ones which we set up. True conversion will always involve serving in love God and for His glory those around us. And true conversion will always involve realizing that the final answers don't come here, but that we, as Paul says here, wait. We're waiting the coming justice of Jesus. The Thessalonians had just such a conversion, and it had been confirmed to Paul as it had been gossiped about all over the place. So conversion is an idea in both the Old and New Testaments. It's basically this idea of, of turning, and used positively, it means turning to God. So a person who turns is said to be a convert. Uh, various people in the New Testament are called converts to Christ. In many ways, the book of Acts is a series of conversions. You have, you know, Pentecost's thousands, and then you have Paul in chapter 9, and Cornelius in 10, and Lydia and the Philippian jailer in 16, and so many others, these stories of these magnificent conversions. So what exactly is conversion? Well, most simply, it is the act of turning from sin to Christ in faith, turning from sin, what the Bible calls repentance, and to Christ. So you might want to look at Acts 20, 21 as a good summary of this. Paul is recounting to the Ephesian elders. He summarizes his preaching to them, and he says in Acts 20, 21, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So conversion is the translation of man from sin to Christ in faith. Christian conversion has continued to create provocation to people around, provocations that give hope to them. Christians were not unique in defending slavery, but they were in the lead in ending it Christians have been the ones who have pioneered education and care for the poor, the rights of women and minorities. Albert Einstein noticed that in Nazi Germany, almost all the scientists and researchers and professors that he admired all submitted to the Nazi tyranny. Only among groups of pedestrian people who were unexciting members of their unexciting churches did Einstein find heroic rebuttal of Nazi doctrine and practice. As a result, Einstein wrote of the church, quote, that which I had hitherto despised, now I wholeheartedly came to honor and admire. I remember when I was living in England for a number of years, an atheist friend of mine in Cambridge was moving up to Scotland, to Edinburgh. And I was talking with him about it and asking him what he was going to do when he got up there. And he said, well, the first thing, of course, I'll do is find a good church. I said, a good church? Why are you going to find a good church? He said, oh, don't worry. It's not that I've become a Christian or anything. He said, but you know, I just, Christians are nice people. Whenever I move to a place, the first thing I always do is find a good church. <laughs> you know, we're very self-critical, and that's, that's in part very appropriate, but we also need to realize the fruit of God's Spirit among us is different than what people experience in the world. We're not perfect. We are sinful as Christians. Romans 7 applies to Christians. At the same time, so does Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Friends, if, if we're really saved, our lives are different. And when you get not just one virtuous person in an office, but a whole community of people together whose lives are different, it's provocative to non-Christians around. People are, are shocked sometimes by the humane lives that go on among Christians. Admitting that Christians are far from perfect, what's going on with both the distinctive character of Christians and, and particularly with the claims standing behind it that they've been converted, that they have been changed. I mean, is conversion simply what William James said, you know, just the sort of breaking in on the conscious mind of connections long growing in the subconscious? Is it some kind of psychological or even physiological brainwashing 
some kind of behavioristic psychology with the Christian evangelist as a kind of amateur Pavlov, merely creating and manipulating reactions and reflexes. It's common today to affirm that we are spiritual beings. This last week at a restaurant I go to all the time in Washington, I'm talking to the guy who's waiting on the table. You have a good conversation with him. And when I ask him just directly if he's a Christian, he says, no. He said, I'm not religious in any organized sense, at which point I thought maybe he was a Baptist. But he said, <laughs> but he said, but I'm definitely spiritual. I'm definitely spiritual. I found, and this man is probably 25, I found that again and again among that generation of those of you who are in your 20s, the strong affirmation of being spiritual even while rejecting religion. It's popular today to humbly deny finding, but to appreciate the journey. But friend, an unending quest, a, a kind of cosmic traffic jam of meaning, you know, when seeking the meaning of your life is something you might sadly accept, you wouldn't rejoice in it. You wouldn't rejoice in the journey in that sense. Gandhi was honest when he wrote in his autobiography, what I want to achieve what I've been striving and pining to achieve these 30 years is self-realization, to see God face to face. I have not yet found Him, but I am seeking after Him, for it is an unbroken fortune to me that I am still so far from Him. I have not seen Him, neither have I known Him. Friends, as Christians, we believe there are countless people throughout history who have come to know God. We understand that conversion is a miracle that brings us to do what Gandhi here admits he never did, to know God. Oh, friend, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, let's just say you happen to come with some religious friends and they said, oh, it'll be interesting, you'll, you'll like the building, the speakers will be good, I'll take you to a good lunch. Uh, we're glad you're here. Come to the Ligonier Pastors Conference every year. You know, the most important thing we could say to you is you really can know God. There really is a point to your life more than what you've already found. You really can be forgiven of your sins against God, those things that your own conscience tells you that you've done that are wrong, and that because God is good, He will judge you for. The eternal Son of God became man. Jesus Christ uh, took up our lot, and He lived a life of perfect trust in our Heavenly Father, and He died on the cross, that most famous piece of Christianity, you know, Jesus on the cross. He died on the cross deliberately and specifically bearing the penalty, paying the price for the sins of anyone that would turn from their sins and trust in Him, from all of us that would do that. Friend, you can know that even as God raised Him from the dead, that you can be raised from your spiritual death to spiritual life if you will simply turn from your sins and trust in Christ. If you want to know more about that, turn and talk to the person next to you at the break. Uh, there's nothing we'd rather talk to you about in this conference than that. That's what we understand in conversion to be. Let me just give you three simple statements about how conversion happens. Three simple statements. Number one, we're called to repent of our sins and believe in Christ. That verse I mentioned in Acts 20, 21 is, is a great one to see that, to understand that. We, it, Paul says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So in Acts 20 and again in Acts 26, 20, Paul seems to summarize his gospel proclamation in terms of his repeat appeal for their response. So closely allied is the news about Jesus to the response demanded. It seems to become a, a part and even a summary of that message. True repentance always accompanies saving faith. True repentance always accompanies saving faith. The lack of one falsifies any credible claim to the other. Calvin said that repentance and faith should be joined rather than confused. So there are these two aspects, repentance, turning away from every form of rebellion in order to serve the living and true God on His own terms, and faith, personal trust in Jesus, the only Savior, the one who has come from God to save us from God's coming judgment of us. We shouldn't misunderstand this faith. This faith is not mere knowledge like the demons are said to have in James 2.19. Nor is it merely the approval of some facts, like say Agrippa approves of in Acts 26.27. There must be a personal trust, a relying on Christ, 
as part of this faith if it is to be saving faith. But that's where the problem comes in. Human depravity. The very thing that makes us need to turn to God, our sin, also prevents us. So what are we to do? The answer to this is not to ignore our need or to try to redefine it or soften it. What we need is to be converted. We need the Holy Spirit of God to convert us. Friends, you realize by by nature we are worship thieves. I love that image that Calvin uses uh, in the Institute's book two where he talks about, he says, we wickedly defraud God of His glory. It's a terrible picture of what we do by nature, but it's true. It's what we do. It's true of every one of us. Now, many of us have repented of our sins, and we've trusted in Christ and are doing so today even. Praise God for that. So, everyone is either a believer or an unbeliever. Everyone is either converted or unconverted. There is no middle ground. And no one is born a Christian, not even those of us who've been born into the home of the most pious Christian that's ever lived. You must be converted to be a Christian. So Paul reminded the Ephesian Christians of what they were before they were converted. Two more statements that I assume are non-controversial among this group, though we could certainly look at any of them more if you thought that was important in Q&A in just a couple of minutes. Number two, God must give us the gifts of repentance and faith. Since we are depraved, God must give us the gifts of repentance and faith. And number three, God uses means to give us these gifts. And the normal means are the right preaching of the Word of God and the right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. There are many ways that our understanding of the gospel shows itself in our understanding of conversion, and conversely, our misunderstandings of one may be reflected in the way we misrepresent the other. Let me come to one that's particularly important for churches today, and this is the the sort of pastoral point that I'm driving at. And let me just give you a couple of of examples. Uh, I don't know how many… One of the things I do is try to look at every new book on the church that comes out. I do not read them. Let me be clear. I do not read them. I look at them. I look at every new book that comes out that I can find. I look at the table of contents. I look at the back. I try to see what they're saying. I do not take the time to read them all. Some I take the time to read. Let me just bring out two that are very recent that I think are typical of what I'm seeing among pastors today and see if you're getting this also. Uh, Let me pick Steve Timmis and Tim Chester's Gospel-Centered Church. Now, an earlier version of it came out in 2002, but 2009, Good Book Company just put out another one. It's part, it comes out of the crowded house movement in Great Britain. Uh, is anybody here familiar with that? Raise your hand if you're familiar with that. Anybody? One person. Okay. Well, oh, it's Jonathan. Sorry, from our own church. Hello, Jonathan. Jonathan's English. Well, yeah. Um, uh, I have some concerns about that movement, but, but more appreciation. Uh, my main difference would be their antipathy toward formal church membership. Uh, I really think that's a, a misunderstanding. They refer to this one person mentioning that there were hoops to jump through before he felt he belonged in our church, end of quote. And that's the way they tend to talk about formal church membership. And my response to that would be, look, if, if, that, if membership is meaningless in your church, well, then, of course, requirements for it will, of course, appear arbitrary and counterproductive and just pointless. But this little book that's come out, Gospel-Centered Church, attractively presents the popular call to build our churches so that people belong before they have to believe. That's the key idea. That's what I want to talk about. Belong before they believe. Uh, Quoting from that book, people are attracted to the Christian community before they're attracted to the Christian message. The best place for belief to emerge is in a context where people already feel they belong. If a believing community is a persuasive witness for the gospel, then people need to be included to see that witness at work. The best way to draw people in is not to make them feel on the outside of what is going on, but to include and involve them. 
That's page 85. Or the next page, page 86. Again, uh, Steve Timmis and Tim Chester, Gospel-Centered Church. Quote, treat people as part of the church even before, in a sense, they really are. It will get messy at times. Church life is a lot easier if you only let respectable, sorted out people into the church in the first place. Other churches may raise their eyebrows, but drunkard, glutton, friend of sinners, these should be badges of honor among those who follow Jesus Christ. Close quote. That's my first example. Second example, my old classmate at Gordon-Conwell, Tim Condor, is even clearer in his 2006 book, A Church in Transition. Quote, a doctrinal approach to community formation also has significant missional liabilities. One common axiom of emerging culture ministry is the declaration that emerging culture persons will join a community before affirming the beliefs of that community. In other words, emerging culture persons place belonging before believing. Using doctrine as the doorkeeper essentially slams shut the front door of the church in the face of spiritual seekers. These persons need to enter and participate in community as part of their search for spiritual truth and goodness. In fact, they are far more likely to make their spiritual discernment based on the quality and characteristics of a community rather than its doctrinal propositions." Close quote. That's Tim Condor, Church in Transition, page 149. I both appreciate what Tim is saying, but also question his assumption of the necessary sort of antagonism and antithesis of believing being foundational to, as he puts it, community formation, over against persons feeling loved and in some profound senses accepted and even belonging in a community. I reject that as a dichotomy. Let me present a different way to come at this. If Jesus Christ came to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15, and if people must, as Jesus said, realize they're sick before they see the need for having a doctor at all, you know, Mark 2.17, then don't people have to be aware of some doctrine? God's right wrath against us for our sins before they understand the one who creates our community, Jesus Christ, and how He does it by His work on the cross. I think that one way we can help each other in a church is by having what you could call high expectations for each other for those who claim to be converted. By high expectations, I simply mean that if you're a communing member of our church, we will treat you like you're converted. We'll assume that you increasingly love God and that you increasingly hate sin and that you are living accordingly and wanting us to help you do that, which is why you've joined. Many churches compromise at just this point in order to gain a sudden influx of members, but by so doing, they usually doom themselves to losing the gospel and finally to extinction. Think carefully. Taking unconverted persons into communing membership in a Christian church will inevitably tend to obscure the gospel. If the gospel is downplayed or confused, the very lifeblood of the church itself is cut off, and the church, is increasingly, the church increasingly loses any distinction from the unbelieving world. And if the salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. This raises the interesting question of how apparently exclusive should we be in our church? How apparently, that is obviously to everybody, not hidden, how apparently exclusive should we be in our church? Should our churches calibrate our times of meeting, the length of our sermons, the style of our music, to the unbelievers we want to reach? It's a question I'm asking. How much is our gathering 
on the Lord's Day for the sake of those who are not Christians? Do we understand our meetings and our church service fundamentally or mainly in terms of evangelism to non-Christians, or are they for the building up of our congregation and the members of it in Christ? Brother pastors, this is another way of considering the question rather than the often discussed, how inclusive should we be? You hear that question all the time. How inclusive should we be? Friends, of course, everybody wants to be inclusive. Brothers and sisters, God has included us in tremendous mercy in Christ. We are people who deeply want to be inclusive. We realize how amazingly merciful God has been to us, so we're in favor of inclusiveness in that sense. Uh, It's obviously loving. The question of how apparently exclusive we should be, perhaps more quickly gets to the point of how we think our transparent differences of life and doctrine reflect a deeper, complete change that the non-Christian must self-consciously own by self-consciously being aware first that they are subject to God's right wrath before they can understand and accept God's love in Christ, and so turn from their sin to savingly trust in Christ. As I said in a sermon recently in our own church in Washington, my non-Christian friend, there is an unavoidable discontinuity between our lives and your life, and we actually serve you best if we're clear about that difference. If you've been enjoying the people, the friendliness, the helpfulness of people in our congregation, that is wonderful. I hope that continues. And the good news I have for you in this is that there is even more to all this than you've experienced. You can try to be winsomely, apparently exclusive. Brothers, I think that this raises some questions about the idea of belonging before believing. We must be careful of giving non-Christians the theological lie, that is, that they, in the most profound sense, belong. In the most profound sense, they don't. And we serve them if we will tell them that. Now, of course, in our churches, we can and should be deliberately inclusive of professing Christians and non-Christians in some senses. And yet we are also deliberately and openly to be exclusive in another sense. We should show them that there is something more than just horizontal community that they can come and participate in, or a vague sense of God's presence in a congregation's life. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying about conversion. Conversion need not be dramatic, emotional conversion created by well-intended emotional manipulation. Nor is conversion the mere assumption of your place in the family pew. Rather, Christian conversion, being born again, being regenerated, is uh, Christian conversion is a self-conscious owning of our sin and of our resolve to repent and trust in Christ. And clarity on this point is essential for Christian faith and life and for Christian churches. Now, there's a ton more that we, I could say about implications about this for preaching, for pastoral care, for evangelism but it's 15 minutes to the hour. I want us to have some time just to talk about this for a minute. So, Chris, do you want to, you, R.C., you want to come up? And um, just think of what implications this may have for us in our churches. Maybe some issues, some, uh, some things you think this addresses that you've seen. Uh, if you have a, a pressing, useful question, I'm going to ask R.C. just to come over here for a minute. And uh, just, brother, anything from this you particularly think is useful for pastors to think of, especially today? And then we'll see what questions or comments the, the friends here have. You're asking me. I'm asking you, just uh, it, the significant importance of that idea of belonging before believing or putting believing first, just anything here. I think this may be one of the greatest crises that face the church today, Mark, that this almost intoxicated desire to build our churches, to get people in, in there, and to accommodate the world, and to make people feel included when in the sight of God they aren't. Now, I, I don't want this to be misunderstood. R.C., you're one of the friendliest people I know. I'm sure you want people at St. Andrew's Chapel yeah, when they visit if they're non-Christians. Feel, I want them to feel welcome. Of course. I want them to feel warm. I want them to feel loved. But I also, if they're unconverted, I want them to know they're unconverted. Yeah, yeah. Because one of the things we have to deal with all the time in the church are people who have a false sense of assurance. Mm-hmm. 
they think that they're Christians when they're not. And it's not my job to convict them of sin. It's my job to preach the Word that the Spirit takes and brings the conviction. I mean, we're not called to be policemen. We're not standing here in the corner saying, stop, you're not allowed in here, yeah. none of that. We should be warm and open and welcome and loving. But you don't design worship hmm. or preaching for the unbeliever. Hmm. I don't think that the primary task of the church on Sunday morning is evangelism. I do evangelism, some, but my top, my top responsibility, I think, is to feed the sheep. Hmm. Don't you? Know? First Corinthians 14, 26, whatever's building up. I the knew there's a verse in there. There it is. <laughs> so, so why do you think it is that so many evangelical and even Reformed pastors today seem to be reluctant to tell non-Christians that they need to be converted? They, they, they seem to not want to talk about that. I'm afraid of offending them. And again, we're in, a, we're in a culture that says exclusivity of any time is a manifestation of intolerance and therefore a lack of charity. Yeah. And that's not what it is. Yeah. It can be. And some people are puffed up with self-righteousness and all the rest. And, but, but the true believer, you know, the old saying that we're just beggars uh, to t- telling other beggars where they can find bread, but we know we found the bread. Mm, amen. You know? Yeah. And I love that bit in Mark 2, you know, where Jesus says, look, I've come not for the healthy but for the sick. It's the sick that need the doctor. So people have to know they're sick before they're going to appreciate Christ as the doctor. Yeah. Uh, friends, any question, comment you want to… Obviously, it needs to be brief in a group this large. We don't have that much time. But anything you think would be relevant for us more generally, not just you personally, but generally? Chris, you want to go right over here? Just give your name and church. Chris is bringing a microphone. And then the brief comment or question. My name is uh, Pastor Omar from Key West, Florida, Grace Tabernacle Church. I believe that one of the greatest sins today is that we've upstaged God and trying to tell Him that the second commandment of fellowship is more important than fellowship, and so that we're very enthralled with being accepted. Rather than being pure, we're reaching for unity rather than purity. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. I think that we know from the polls that the number one reason that motivates people to come to church on Sunday morning is not worship. It's for fellowship. And we pick up on that either consciously or unconsciously. We design our buildings. We design our, our services. We design everything about it to make people feel comfortable in an atmosphere of fellowship. And they may never, never, never get the slightest glimpse of the character of the God they're assembled to worship. And that's, we're not doing anybody a favor by doing that. Amen. Somebody else? Anything else before we have a break? Right here. Yeah, I do a lot of wait, wait, wait. We've got to get a microphone so people in the back can hear. Here it yeah. goes. Hurry up, Chris. Yeah. Run. Move. Here he goes. Um, we all belong to a piece. Name here. and church? Yeah. Uh, First Presbyterian, uh, Fernandina Beach, and we're all here with… Uh, uh, wishing wannabe uh, PCA church, but we're PCUSA. Hmm. And uh, all of us are very involved with Evangelism Explosion. I mean, on the side, we cannot get our pastor to embrace this whole concept that you have hmm. to know that you're lost before you can be found. Hmm. And um, uh, D. James Kennedy's diagnostic questions, the first one, do you believe you're going to heaven when you die? Most people in our church would say yes. You know, when you ask that question, most people think that they're good. Um, R.C. Sproul, I realize that you say your job is not to convert, but to just preach. Gosh, most of these people just come to church once a week. They're, if they don't hear it from the pastor, they don't hear that the penalty of sin is death and the free gift from God is eternal life. And unless you repent and turn and put your trust in what he did for you and not yourself, they're never going to hear it. And I spent you know, my 30 years or 25 years going to a church and never hearing the gospel. And it took a guy coming to me in the street in New York City um, presenting the four spiritual laws. And right there, I felt the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And my first reaction was, why did I never hear that from my pastor? Mm. Yeah. Amen. We want to share the gospel. And, you know, I think if you do the services right, and, you know, I don't know that R.C. and I would do everything the same way liturgically, but there would be a lot of similarities. I think you'd find the gospel is going to be there in the service. I mean, even before the sermon, prayer of confession, assurance of pardon, the hymns that are sung, 
you're going to get the gospel of who God is, who we are, what Christ has done, and what we should do in that, and then in the sermon as well. Yeah, but the church is not a stationary Billy Graham rally. You know, we're about more than that. We're about that, but we're about more than that. You know, in the early church, we know from early church history in the first century church, the pattern was kerygma followed by didache. The apostolic preaching in the marketplace, they preached the gospel, people responded, they repented, they believed, they were admitted into the church, and then subjected to catechetical instruction and preaching and teaching in, in the Word of God. It can't be nurture or evangelism. It's got to be nurture and evangelism. But what I'm saying is it's the chief purpose on Sunday morning. And that's not the only time that we speak or preach or teach is Sunday morning. But in the Sunday morning assembling together the saints, I don't think that the primary aim of that is evangelism. I agree. Yeah. Last one. I am with uh, Gospel through Colombia, a mission organization for Latin America. And uh, the question is, how do you share with the Roman Catholics who believe that because they believe in Christ, they are safe, but they uh, will not hear that is through Christ alone? And how would you bring this message to them, indicating that it is Christ alone? They are um, in the ones who learn the Christian manner of speech, that you say, yeah, I'm going to heaven because I trust in Christ, they say, yes, I believe in Christ, I trust in Christ, okay. so I can continue to be a Roman Catholic. And I have to thank Dr. Sproul for making the difference this morning about the Catholic Church, that we as Christians will not allow a pagan church to steal the name of Catholics to us, from us. Now, if you can just remain standing for a second. Alejandro, where are you? From our church? Alejandro Malero? Alejandro, oh, that's the brother I want you to meet. No, I? Right over here, Alejandro. Right? You guys should meet each other at the break. How do we evangelize Roman Catholics and make it clear that they have to be saved only by trusting Christ alone? R.C., you've got a lot of experience of that here oh, with yeah. a building that looks like this. You must get, <laughs> you must get Roman Catholics coming in all oh, the time. We do, with the name of our church, St. In St. Andrews? And everything else. They I'll, think you're Father R.C. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, constantly uh, help our, try to help our people understand the difference between the Roman understanding of the gospel and the Reformation biblical understanding of the gospel. And, and I, I try, you mentioned earlier that it, I think you were quoting Roger Nicole. I was, about okay. that. I deal with those who disagree. It used to be when, I would be, when I was a professor of philosophy in a secular university, and I had to teach secular philosophy, I, my goal was to present that guy's position as well as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And it's the same principle in evangelism and apologetics. I think most Protestants don't have a clue about what Roman Catholic Church teaches about salvation. And I take the time to explain it. Here's how you're saved according to Rome. It starts… So you think you should actually explain to I a Roman explain Catholic them the difference what their own church own. teaches? What happens in their own church is that if they die with any impurity on their soul, they go to purgatory. They don't go to hell as long as it's not a mortal sin. Explain all that and say that they may spend a week, they may spend a million years in purgatory in the place of purging before they can be admitted into the presence of God. And I say the simple difference is this. Before God will accept you and justify you, you must be inherently just. Mm -hmm. I don't want to slander them, and I'm very careful to point out, Rome says you can't be really just without faith, without grace, and without Christ. Mm -hmm. So they salute those three things. Mm -hmm. But with the aid of faith and grace in Jesus, you can and must become inherently righteous in order to be justified. Mm -hmm. And I said to me, that's bad news. Yeah, yeah because I have no hope. And even Rome will admit that in the course of church history, there have been a handful of people who, when they died, went directly to heaven, the saints. For us, average people, we're going to either go to hell or to purgatory. And I'm saying that the gospel is this, that it's faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. And if you put your trust in Christ and in Christ alone, all that He is 
and all that he's done become yours right now. Amen. And heaven is yours right now. No more purgatory, no more treasury saints, no more indulgences, none of that stuff. I mean, the Roman Catholic doctrine is anything but good news. And I like to get people to see that and yet be as fair as I could possibly be. I want to know Roman Catholic theology better than the local priest. And I think I do, <laughs> frankly. I majored in that in graduate school. But uh, again, a Roman Catholic, if you ask him, are you a believer? Nine out of ten of them will not say, I'm a Catholic Christian. Yeah. They'll say, I'm a Catholic. Why do they say that? Because they really do believe in sacerdotalism. They really do believe that the instrument of salvation is the church, that the church through the sacraments saves them. And as long as they're going to church, going through the sacraments, going to confession, they're in. But they don't have a clue about what the gospel is. Yeah. Friends, our time is up for this session. Hope you've profited from this, and we will look forward to hearing the Word of God further in just a this, few minutes. This was an extra bonus that came up at the last minute, and I just want to say how much I appreciate Mark's doing that for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks,